Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I'm quite chuffed to be invited here tonight because I'm the only one of the three of us that hasn't been on Garden Australia. <laughs> okay. So, um, passive house buildings basically take the principles of solar passive design and construction and apply building physics to them. This allows us to maximise the return of the various aspects of solar passive design and construction. Additionally, it focuses on a few key areas in greater depth. It means that we can achieve better results across a wider range of building types and a wider range of climates. It also takes into account condensation. Now, condensation is a growing issue in our buildings. It's been occurring ever since we started insulating and it's causing some major health and construction issues. So let's look first, what is a, pa a passive house building? At its most basic, it's simply one that performs the way we think our homes currently perform. So when we close up our windows and our doors to keep the heat out in summer or to keep the warmth in winter, we're actually not. Our buildings are very, very leaky. Most houses of an average size will have at least an open window's worth of leaks, if not an open door or more for larger ones. So we're not actually isolating the indoor climate from the outdoor climate. This, of course, requires extra energy, heating and cooling to keep the home comfortable. Here's a thermal image I've taken of a skirting board to uh, demonstrate one of these leaks. Um, you can probably see the yellow line there. That's hot air leaking in through the wall structure. And this is only about a 33 degree day, 25 inside with air conditioning on. If it was 40 or 45 degrees, that leak would be much bigger. Now, there's a misconception that we need these leaks for our houses to breathe, and that is not the case. We certainly need our houses to be ventilated, but unless we do this in a controlled manner, we end up wasting lots of energy and we end up with health issues. This is mould inside a wall. And one of the reasons it's there is because of air leaks. You can see how the black has uh, even eaten away at the timber framing. So if we let our houses ventilate through the leaks, we're breathing in the air that comes through here, so we're breathing in the mould spores, the rat poo, and whatever else might be in there. Passive house buildings actually isolate the indoor climate from the outdoor climate. So it means when we shut up our windows and doors, we're actually isolating it. And they also require little to no heating or cooling, and they're also much healthier. So passive house is actually a system. In a nutshell, it's a tool to predict a building's performance, some principles to then achieve that performance, and really key quality construction and testing to ensure we've met the performance. There's no other system that mandates testing. Actually make sure you've achieved what you set out to do. Let's define performance. We want our buildings to be comfortable, we want them to be healthy, and we want to do this in an efficient manner. I'm going to go into a bit of detail about what comfort actually is. These are a couple of screenshots from the Bureau of Meteorology app. So the big number is the air temperature. Below that you can see it feels like, which is our comfort temperature. A bit further down we've got a wind uh, speed and then humidity. So if you first look at the Penrith example on the left, this 41 de degree day actually felt a bit cooler at 36. This is because we had quite a strong breeze, but critically, very low humidity at 18%. Conversely, in Cairns on the right, a 31 degree air temperature day felt hotter at 35. Partly this is because of a lower breeze, but more importantly, because we had really high humidity, 77%. So comfort is made up of these three factors, the air temperature, the air movement, and also the humidity. So in a passive house, we set parameters for those three factors. We try and keep our temperature, our air temperature, between 20 and 25 degrees year round. We want our humidity to remain between about 35 and 65% year round. And we want to control our air circulation. So we have no drafts from the air leaks, no convection currents, and no temperature layering. This is achieved by preventing a radiant heat or cold from surfaces affecting the air. So in a passive house, we make sure that the difference between the air temperature and the surface temperatures is no more than 4.2 degrees. All of this happens whilst using very small amounts of energy. 
So the heating and cooling costs in a passive house will average out to be less than the cost of a coffee a day for an average size home. That figure of 15 kilowatt hours is the maximum allowable to achieve certification. We've already looked at uh, what mould can do inside a building cavity. Uh, from a health perspective, passive houses are mould free, not only in the cavities, but in the building themselves. Passive houses do use a ventilation system to make sure we are keeping the air controlled and healthy. This takes the stale air out, which includes the carbon dioxide that we're breathing out, as well as any chemicals that might off gas from furniture, flooring and the like. We then bring fresh air in from outside and it is filtered. So we remove things like pollen and dust and air pollution. Again, this is whilst using very small amounts of energy for heating and cooling, and indeed very small amounts of energy for running the whole building. Let's look at that efficiency in a bit more detail. This is the Sapphire. Uh, it's a certified passive house that's built by Blue Eco Homes, completed last year. It's at Falconbridge and it's open for tours and Blue Eco Homes are here in the audience if you want to talk to them afterwards. Um, it's 183 square metres excluding the garage and I'm using an energy cost for this calculation of 27 cents a kilowatt hour, which seems about average at the moment. The daily averaged energy bill for this house will be $1.76. Now the vast majority of the year, you won't need any heating or cooling, but for those extreme times, 40 degrees plus for a week, and you wanna use some air conditioning, the cost of that divided by 365 gives you this number. As an example, there was a day this summer where it was 40 degree, 45 degrees outside, inside without any cooling, got to 27 degrees. Now that 27 degrees is outside our comfort zone of 25. So we can bring it back to that area by either turning on the ceiling fans, which gives us about one to three degrees of comfort. We can do a bit of dehumidification. Or if you want to use the air conditioning, we only need to drop two degrees, not 20 degrees. So how do we do it? Step one is the Passive House Planning Package, or PHPP. It's basically a really complicated Excel spreadsheet. Uh, in it, we input all the information, the design, the site details, things like um, shading, other buildings, etc. cetera, uh, climate data, not only temperature, obviously, but things like solar radiation. We put the materials we might use, we put the type of construction we might use. We can then play around with aspects of that, like the materials, construction and design, until we can optimise the performance of the building to get the results we're after. The reason it's a spreadsheet and not a software package is because it allows us to easily update uh, the ongoing testing and research of passive house buildings around the world. It also allows us to update things like materials, research and science as that comes to hand. PHPP will predict the energy of, and performance of a building with 95% accuracy. What that means is if you happen to fall in that other 5%, instead of your building being between 20 and 25 degrees, it might be between 19 and 26. The next step is actually the way we build and it's all about the building envelope. And the building envelope is what surrounds the parts of the house we live in all the time. First step is we have an airtight layer. So surrounding the whole building envelope, a layer that keeps, uh, isolates the indoor climate from the outdoor climate. It also um, helps us with our moisture control. Next, we have a continuous layer of insulation, again, around the whole building envelope. Insulation is not just good for keeping the warmth in in winter, but it's extremely effective at keeping the heat out in summer. And a passive house rated building will generally have more insulation in it than the construction code. Our insulation layer is only as good as its weakest points, and the weakest point in any building is the window. Windows are notoriously leaky and uh, let air in and out, not only through gaps, but through uh, convection and radiation. So we need to have a better quality window to match the climate. The more extreme the climate, the more high performance the window we need. The example on the screen is a very high performance window, you can see from the cross section, the thermal imaging there, that there is no transfer from the warm side to the cool side. This is an example of an extremely poor performing window. This is a double glazed window, but it's a standard aluminium frame. And you can see how the frame is leaking heat into the building. 
This is called a thermal bridge, and thermal bridges are the next thing we try and get rid of in a passive house. Not only things like window frames, but corners, and anywhere where we've got a change of material. Now, we obviously can't eliminate corners, but we can construct them differently so that they don't act as a thermal bridge. The top left picture shows a stud frame construction with uh, insulation between it, thermal image obviously, and you can see how the studs are leaking energy. Now, there's nothing wrong with stud frame, you just need to build it properly so it's not a thermal bridge. Finally, as I mentioned, we have a ventilation system. It keeps the air nice and fresh and healthy. However, it's no good bringing all that fresh air in from the outside if it's 45, 50 degrees and it's just going to heat the house up. So it has what it's called a heat recovery unit and it literally takes the heat out of the air. Using the example on the screen, if it's 40 degrees outside, 20 degrees inside, the heat recovery works 90% efficiency. So it takes 18 degrees of temperature out of that air so that the fresh air coming in is a down at nice 22 degrees. All of these aspects of the building envelope are best practice when it comes to condensation management. And what does condensation do? That mould that we saw before. And this example is only 12 years old. It's in Sydney's inner west, which is arguably a very mild climate. So the more extreme the climate, the more chance of condensation. And it's built to what is the, the current construction code. Finally, as I said, Passive House uses uh, mandates testing, and it's the only system to do so. One of the main tests is a blower door test to make sure our airtight layer is good. The maximum allowable in a Passive House is 0 0.6 air changes per hour. That's 0 0.6 air changes per hour. To put that in perspective, testing on Australian homes has revealed the average is about 15 cha air changes per hour, some even as high as 30 or more. If your building is leaking to the extent of 15 air changes per hour and you're cooling it with your air conditioning, that means you're cooling the volume of that building 15 times every hour and it's costing you a fortune. Once we've completed our testing, we put the results back into our PHPP to make sure the standard is met. Um, if it's not, we go back and we test again until we get it right. So what does a passive house building look like? The answer is anything you want. Passive house is not just about houses. It comes from the German term passive house. House means building. As you can see from these photos, there's commercial buildings, there's offices, multi-residential, schools, there's a car dealership, including its workshops in Canada, there's shopping centres. Schools in particular work really well. All those kids in a room are breathing out lots of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide makes you naughty. The ventilation system takes the carbon dioxide out of the air, and what they found is passive house rated schools, the students are far more alert and attentive. This last couple of photos is a project of mine that's under construction. We're turning a little old brick veneer into a passive house. So yes, you can refurbish and rebuild to the standard. However, if we look at a passive house in infrared, we see a massive distance difference. This is a um, wintertime shot. It's a row of terraces. And as you can see, the passive house that's been upgraded uh, is leaking far less heat than the rest. Just to show how well passive house is suited to the Australian climate, uh, at the beginning of last year in Melbourne, we held what's called an icebox challenge. So we built two little boxes, one to Passive House, one to the National Construction Code, six star. We put a 720 kilogram block of ice in each, sensors inside and outside. At the end of 12 days of a Melbourne summer, the Passive House had 143 kilograms of ice remaining. The six star house had none. If you want to look at the temperature humidity graphs quickly, because I'm running out of time, the blue line is the um, Passive House. You can see it's quite stable. The red line is the six-star code house, which is not a lot better to the, to, than the outside conditions. Passive House started in Germany about 30 years ago and since has spread throughout the world. This map's actually quite out of date. The reason, uh, it's actually being adopted by many councils, cities and states um, around the world as if not their building code, then best practice. This because it's a holistic system that actually achieves the results it sets out to and it works straight out of the box. Rather than having lots of rules and regulations, they can just say, use Passive House. Um, if you would like further information, you can look at the 
uh, Australian Passive House Association website. Passivepedia is like our Bible. Uh, some of the information is free, some available to members. Passive House Institute in Germany, and yes, you can click on the English button. And if you can't remember any of these, if you go to my website, there's links there for you. Thank you very much.